All right. Well, it is noon on Wednesday, so I am super excited about this week's guest in this week's webinar. I'm Sarah Hanwald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development with One Schoolhouse. And with me, as always, is Peter Gao, the Independent Curriculum Director here at One Schoolhouse. And we have a really special guest with us here today, Rebecca Plona, who is a teacher at Miss Porter School and has been for some time. She is also a psychology teacher here with One Schoolhouse. And she teaches a course that I cannot wait for her to tell everybody about. So how is everybody today? All is well. Doing yeah. fine, Sarah. All right, so if Peter, if you'll kick us off and I'm just gonna remind everybody that we'll use the chat for connecting with one another and sharing resources and we will use the Q&A for questions. Great, well, thank you, Sarah. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Peter. Well, Rebecca, <laughs> when we talked before about this, um, your journey to get to the work you're doing now, you know, because I think just calling you a teacher of psychology um, doesn't really get at the nature of what you do as a teacher, uh, as well as the nature of how you got there. I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, please. Absolutely. So in my face-to-face -face school at Miss Porter's, I am the director of our Teaching and Learning Center, which we abbreviate as TLC. And I think that that really is the foundation of my work with students, is making sure that students feel supported and seen. I've also taught psychology quite a bit over the years in the various roles that I've had at various schools. So when I had the chance to join one schoolhouse, that was really exciting. And then this summer, Kareen Dedini asked me, would you be interested in developing a course on happiness for our, for our program for students as electives? And I was incredibly excited. One of the things that Kareen had learned about me over time was about five years ago, as many people in their early 40s do, I started wondering what else was there in the world? What else was there that I could be looking at? And I started getting really interested in the concept of positive psychology. And positive psychology, for those of you familiar with it, is the scientific study of thriving. Most psychology focuses on things that aren't going quite so well. What are the obstacles that a person might be experiencing in their life? Positive psychology instead looks at how you thrive, how you succeed. What are the factors that go into living a, a fulfilling and fulfilled life? And so having the chance to adapt those principles for a high school audience was incredibly exciting. And so I am absolutely loving having designed now teaching this course with One Schoolhouse. So one of the reasons that we invited you here this particular week is that this is the time of year when we're all talking about gratitude, but there's really more to gratitude than remembering around the Thanksgiving table to say the things that we're grateful for. So what's powerful about gratitude? So gratitude is a concept that's defined as the felt sense of wonder thankfulness and appreciation for life. And like you just said, Sarah, it's bigger than just that Thanksgiving feeling. And it really taps into the underlying principles of happiness. When we talk about the aspects of happiness that researchers have found, Martin Seligman, who is the psychologist who's really credited with coining the phrase positive psychology, certainly not the first person to study happiness, but the person who really began to pull together all of these, all of these threads that create this theory, he really talked about happiness involving five things, positive emotion, engagement with other people in the world around you, relationships with people, having a sense of meaning in your life, and then accomplishments, being able to look at the things that you have done in your life, whether they be grand or small, and having a good feeling of, of completion with those. And so when you look at gratitude, Gratitude is almost the act of engaging in a lot of these pieces of the positive psychology building blocks really all together in one place. And so when you talk about the action of gratitude, this is what we call in positive psychology, a positive activity intervention. It's something that you can do that taps into all of these pieces and creates this feeling of happiness and well-being. Oh, Peter, you're muted. <laughs> oh, 
but I can unmute. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Rebecca, for that. As you were talking, I was just thinking about all of the emotions that so many of us are experiencing and so many of us are experiencing from the people around us in this COVID pandemic time. And many of those are about having relationships, feeling a little bit sundered, um, feeling as though the connections that they need and want to make with people aren't there. And so I think people may think of themselves as sort of moving away from thriving as, as this goes forward. I've also been aware though, that I think for some people, um, people are learning now to work, to work harder to reach out, to build those connections with other people. You can't build them in the ways you normally could. How else can we do it? We're always looking for alternatives to, um, you know, we're all gonna be thinking about if only we could be sitting around the Thanksgiving dinner table with all of our friends in the United States, if you're, that's where your school is, that's where you are uh, this year. And that's probably not gonna be happening so much, but there are other things happening too. And I'm just thinking about all of the interdependencies and the complexities of, of thriving in a time when uh, the, the media are telling us we're not thriving. And yet I, I feel sometimes as though people may be doing better than we think we are. I don't know, is that crazy? Uh, how, do, how is this all coming together, I guess, the interdependencies? So it, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting question and I would, I would reply with an anecdote. So in the course that I'm teaching for One Schoolhouse, the happiness course, one of the foundational activities that we're working on as a class is we are looking at that, for the students, it's a weekly practice of gratitude. So what it's assignment they have every week is they must engage in something expressing their gratitude to someone, something. When we look at gratitude, we don't just look at saying, hey, Peter, thank you so much. For some people, gratitude might be more spiritual. You might be thanking something larger than yourself. You might be being grateful for nature. You might be being grateful for food and for a roof over your head. So when you talk about the interdependencies, I have given the students really very few parameters with their gratitude. And I love watching what they come up with each week. There is a young man who in the first couple of weeks of the course was making a meal for his family. It was his first week. His second week, he spent time learning from his grandmother how to make one of her specialties because he knows she won't be around forever. We have a young lady who wrote, hand wrote thank you notes to all of her teachers about three weeks into the school year because she was recognizing all of the efforts that had been made on her behalf and her classmates behalf. And so watching the students look beyond what we might consider the form thank you note, thank you so much for thinking of me on my, on my birthday. But really what are the larger ways we can express gratitude and what are ways that we can weave that into our everyday life? And as you mentioned, in these moments where we're feeling very disconnected from our communities and from the larger world, looking for those points of connectivity and really working to cultivate that even from a distance is, is really critical to that sense of thriving. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. What are some ways that adults can non sort of didactically uh, help the, the children in their lives, whether they are 17 or seven, um, engage in this kind of work? Yeah. You know, one of the things, one of the things I think is really important is modeling it. I think that sometimes for that that relationship with adults and children, whether it's with our students or with our own offspring, we sometimes get into that power dynamic is that we are the givers and they are the receivers. And sometimes flipping that a little bit and expressing gratitude to our students for what they're giving us can be a really powerful experience. So being able to say to a student, you know, thank you for bringing up that really amazing point in class, or thank you for adding something to the conversation that I didn't expect. And I had, a, I'd had an occasion this, this fall in writing my comments for One Schoolhouse to say to a student, thank you for pushing me as a teacher, for asking about a topic 
that I had to sit back and think before I responded and before I brought it into our dialogue. And thank you for helping me learn and grow. I think that's a really powerful thing to model for students that there are ways that this gratitude can go both ways. Thank you. That's wonderful. I've been, this, as an aside, I guess, one of the things I've been enjoying really beginning last spring is watching student performances online, how students in performing arts programs are adapting to, and their teachers, of course, adapting to uh, the, the situation. And I just watch those shows and I feel so grateful to those kids for the work they're doing and to the teachers and the schools for all of the effort. It's just making me so happy to watch these things. So. I recommend this to anybody listening. <laughs> and then the gratitude those students have for being able to have a moment to still engage in their passions. And, and I, I know exactly what you mean. I have an advisee who is in Saudi Arabia and she was a lead player in our show that was staged primarily here in Connecticut. And when I spoke with her today in our advisory meeting and I praised her for her performance, the first thing she said was, I'm so grateful to our drama director for making it possible for me to engage, even though I wasn't physically present. Well, thank you. I like the way that you share that. Um, you know, the way we we create a culture and then and then that grows from there. So when we were talking before, um, when we were planning out this webinar, I know sometimes we seem incredibly spontaneous, but we do have a call to add a time and, and do some pre-thinking. Um, I asked you a little bit about, you know, what you might hold on to before, and you said something that I wrote down, and um, I want to ask you to share your thoughts on this again, because I think other people might be as struck as I was, which was, may we never think as small as we did before, and that really struck me, and what I'm going to give you a moment to think, because I want to thank Emily for sharing something in the chat that actually made my heart skip a beat because I could only see the first line and I thought, oh my gosh, we've been Zoom bombed or something else. So if you've got a resource to share, please share it in the chat. Um, Emily, I'm looking forward to checking that out. And if you've got questions for Rebecca, put them in the Q&A, please. So when we were talking before about one of the, we were talking kind of about the, the hidden blessings of the pandemic, correct? the things that we were having the opportunity to explore and experience as a result of really being forced to pause and to rethink the way that we do things. And I think so often we have been in, I would say in, in Western driven culture, we've been so driven by achieve and move on, do and move on, accomplish and move on. And we've been forced to take a pause with that. We haven't been able to accomplish or achieve or do in the same way that we've been used to for, for many years in, in our culture, both in our schools and in our wider society. And so needing to think creatively and needing to rely on others and needing to reach out, you know, again, kind of going off the example that I just shared about the advisee in Saudi Arabia, for our drama director to pull off that show with multiple actors and technical people who were not physically present on campus. Our drama director herself is not currently physically present on campus. So the need to reach out and ask for community to rally and to wrap around each other and to care for each other has been really significant in this moment. And it's, it's put us in a position to pause and to be grateful to, to look to these people that we might not necessarily have asked for help before and asking us to be a little bit vulnerable and to reach out to our colleagues and our friends and our peers and our family and say, can you, can you do this for me so that we can continue to go on and thrive? That is such a great point. And we've got a question in the Q&A, which is what about adult to adult when we have adults in really different situations in our community, some who, of whom are maybe the, the exact line is feel like they're drowning this year. So how can adults help other adults? One of the things that I've really tried to make a point to do this year is find moments 
to express my gratitude to colleagues and to try to do so in a way that might be a little bit more public than I might have done before, in part because we, we don't have the same formats that we've had before where you get to see somebody in the dining hall or passing in the hallways. Even our faculty meetings, we do begin at, at Porter's, we begin every faculty meeting with shout outs and appreciations to our colleagues, but we don't always have enough time to do all of those appreciations. And so I would say I'm, I'm actively looking for moments that I can reach out to colleagues and say, I wanna thank you for how you handled this. The way you helped this particular student made a huge difference in her life. And I want you to know I saw you. That seeing and that noticing in this moment where we all feel so siloed and so isolated, so many of us in our own homes on Zoom, really feeling that disconnect from that community, that moment of reaching out and saying, I saw, you. Thank you for what you've done. Even doing that once or twice a week can make all of the difference to that person. I had shared with Sarah and Peter as we were preparing for this that a particular student I work with had come in and was prepared for a test because of the efforts of her teacher. Her teacher had really in, her, in the student's mind gone above and beyond with providing a study guide. And so I reached out to that colleague and I copied her department chair and I copied our Dean of Faculty and said, I just want you to know this particular student just feels on top of the world because of what you've done. That colleague reached out to me afterwards privately and she said, you had no way of knowing this, but I was just at such a low point that day with everything that was going on and your reaching out and expressing your gratitude made all of the difference to me in that moment. We never know where our colleagues are. And so taking that moment to express that gratitude and reach out that hand and that kindness could mean something that we had no idea it might mean. So we've got a couple of questions coming in. The first one um, says, can you suggest some resources for developing our own electives in positive psychology? So maybe talk a little bit about your real adventuring into learning more about this. Absolutely. And so as I, as I had alluded to before, in 2015, I believe it was, 2015, early 2016, I had done some study with Maria Sorois, who was with the Whole Being Institute. And she was doing a, a let's call it a seminar. It lasted about three months at the Kripalu Institute, which is not too far from where I live. So I went up there several times and did some work with her and began to learn a little bit about the tenets of positive psychology. I also then began doing some study on my own and discovered Dr. Lori Santos, who is down at Yale. Many of you have likely heard of Dr. Santos. Her course at Yale on happiness is the most popular course that Yale has ever offered. And Coursera offers her course. And so I signed up and took that. And then I started really digging into all of the resources that were out there. So it was almost as if, Corrine didn't know that I was doing this independently, but it was almost as if we'd had this conversation before when she reached out, I had already pulled together a fair number of resources that are available for folks. So I would suggest looking into Dr. Santos' work it's very accessible and very easy to modify for a high school audience. Um, Dr. Seligman in his, at the University of Pennsylvania also has a fairly significant program that focuses on positive psychology and a website that offers quite a lot of information. It's called authentichappiness.org, I believe. And that's another wonderful resource for looking into some of these materials. They do need to be adapted for high school or for middle school, but they are adaptable. Great, and I'm putting just a couple of things in the link in the chat that you've mentioned. Um, and then I got one question via a direct message. This person wanted to know, where do you sort of draw the line and think about um, when you're providing sort of services and when you're providing education? Like, does that line get blurry for you as an educator? So for me, it's a question of, am I working with skills and content or am I beginning to work with the individual student around obstacles in their own life? And so my background is as a therapist. So I am always looking for that piece. And I do maintain both at my face-to-face -face school and then of course at one schoolhouse also, 
very strong relationships with our clinical services folks. And I don't hesitate if there's something that's coming up for a student to say to that student, this is going beyond the bounds of the course and it's something that I absolutely wanna support you in exploring on your own. Let's find another avenue for that. And I know that sometimes that can feel, especially for younger faculty, that can feel like a bit of a fraught moment. I think a lot of it is being very clear on what our roles are and also being very clear on what the resources are to support us. And if we ever have any questions about whether or not something that's happening with a student might go outside the boundaries of an educational experience and maybe more into an experience that needs a different level of support, being able to check in with our colleagues in the counseling department. That is such a great point in terms of that whole you know, we talk about our village and our teamwork and, and making sure that everybody stays in touch. Have you done any workshops on campus with campus adults? So last week, we, let me rewind. I often do the yoga nidra practice for students when we have a community day or when we have a wellness day on campus. I always volunteer to, to lead the yoga nidra, which is the deep relaxation portion. Any of you who practice yoga, you know it's that wonderful time at the end where you put the blanket over you and often fall asleep. And so I will do that as a full practice for students about half an hour to 45 minutes, you know, maybe once or twice a year and it's always very well attended. I had had a faculty member approach me and say, hey, I, I heard you did this and would you be interested in offering it for colleagues? And I said, of course, it's something that I, I love doing. And when we talk again about gratitude, it's a gift that I can give. It's a skill that I have that, that can be very helpful. So I had done that last week for colleagues. We probably had about six people come and join us. It was on Zoom, so everybody was in their own home, very comfy, very quiet. And I led them through the yoga nidra practice. And at the end, as folks were expressing their gratitude to me, I said, you know what, I, I am grateful to all of you for giving me the opportunity to give this gift. So often when I'm working in student support, so oftentimes my work is so targeted with students, not so much a gift for faculty directly, the ability to do that, to take an hour of my afternoon and to give a gift to colleagues was really for me rejuvenating. And that's the secondary part of gratitude is the gratitude is really wonderful for the recipient, but the person who's able to be doing the giving also benefits. And so it's really, it's really one of those reciprocal situations. Thank you. Oh, Peter, you're still muted. <laughs> World, the world's been hoping for that for years. The, <laughs> this is a, a, a funny question, and I'm not sure uh, whether I'm going to frame it very well, but I have found on several occasions in my life that have been occasions of great hardship and great sorrow, that when I've gone through those experiences, what I emerge, how I emerge from those is in a place where I am much more attuned to my own need to feel gratitude. And I think a lot of us are in, you know, people in, in a pretty bad space this year. This has been a, a, a terrible, terrible year for so many people. How do we, how do we dig in and find the, the, the spaces for gratitude in, in, in situations that are, are dreadful? And How does that work? <laughs> I think any of us who have who have dealt with a, a, a situation of loss or a situation of deep pain know that in those moments our world really becomes very narrow and focused. And so much of what we're working on is just putting one foot in front of the other. And I would say a lot of it for me when I have been in those moments and I can, only, I can only answer the question personally, a lot of those for me have been holding onto those moments of good, even in everything around me being so very difficult. So the course that I had mentioned with, with Dr. Sirois that I took at Carpalo was actually titled a short course in happiness after loss. 
And I had chosen that particular one because my father had passed away just a couple of months earlier and he had been quite young when he passed away. I was not looking to lose my father so early. And there was, a, there was some time for me in really wanting to go forward well. And so as you're saying, Peter, in those moments where things feel very, very difficult, how do you go forward well? And that was one of the things that, that Dr. Soros was really focusing on is the idea of keeping things very simple and linear and choosing that one good thing in all the darkness. I am grateful for my friend who was willing to listen to me while I was sad. I am grateful for my cozy bed and my warm sheets because that's really all that I wanna be doing right now. And really choosing, and, and we do this a lot of times as educators, right, with students, what's the one good thing? And so that I think has been a real lifeline for folks who are in really difficult circumstances is can we choose a good thing and have that moment even if everything else feels really complicated and really difficult and in many places almost overwhelming is there that one good thing thank you thank you very much is there anything we've got uh, just a couple of minutes left. So if you have a last question, uh, get it in. Otherwise, Sarah's going to monopolize all of Rebecca's time. But is there anything as we go into a Thanksgiving pause that is not going to be the Thanksgiving you know, vacation that many of us are used to or the, or the big raucous gatherings? Is there anything you want folks to keep in mind that maybe stems from the science of thriving? What is something that people can remind themselves of as they go forward into a holiday that's not gonna be the one they would have chosen. So I think, I think what I would say is remembering that there are multiple ways to nurture and sustain those relationships. That face-to-face -face and that, that in-person is obviously what we all want. And in these moments where that's often not possible, for distance, for safety, looking to those other ways to nurture those relationships. And what can we do? My best friend texted me yesterday and she said, I'm mailing you your holiday present. It will arrive on Monday, open it now. Don't wait for the holiday. And so now I have this anticipation. I have this moment, I'm excited. What is she sending me? I don't know what it's going to be. Is, is it perishable? Is it something I'm going to eat? But this is a way for her to nurture the relationship. She, she, lives in, she lives about 200 miles from me. We don't see each other this year very much at all because of the pandemic. But now I have that moment of anticipation. So she chose a way to nurture the relationship that she knows is gonna bring me great joy because she knows I love surprises and she knows I love presents. And so that would be my challenge to people. What are ways we can continue to sustain and nurture those relationships when we can't be together. And look for those moments that we can make those connections and nurture those connections. Thank you. Anna. And we have one last question. I also wanna say there have been a number of resources shared in the chat. So if you, um, we'll save all of those and post them underneath on YouTube when we do that because people have been sharing a lot of resources. So the last one is just really a, also a great reminder that some of our independent schools are steeped in whiteness and very waspy culture. And can we take a moment to speak about, or can you, Rebecca, take a moment to speak about how to be culturally competent even as we teach our students to embrace gratitude? I think one of the things that I think about a lot is that cultures that are more rooted in collectivism, that are more focused on the group and the whole, rather than the more individualistic culture that we tend to experience in westernized culture, really seeing the value of that and really turning to our colleagues and our students who they themselves practice a more collective view of the world and really honoring their traditions and really listening to their voices and really asking and thanking them for those moments where they are willing to allow their white colleagues a glimpse 
of their experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are out of time. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we will not be here next week at noon. So we'll see you in two weeks at noon. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.